So I wonder uh, who here has ever tried to persuade someone to do something that you suspect they don't want to do? Has anyone ever ever tried to do that? Yeah, most, most people have tried, right? Um, and how did you go about trying to change that person's mind? Uh, what, were your, what were your methods? Any, any ideas, Andrew? Distraction. You you flew an airplane over the. You know, yes, distraction might be might be one strategy. What are some other strategies? Bribery, right? You offer something in return for what you're asking for. Raising your voice, being louder, more emphatic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ron. Ooh, facts. Ron says, show them the data, right? Yeah, like. Make a logical argument based on the information that you have. That that is one way to try to win an argument. Guilt. Guilt. Yes. Or, or obligation, right? Like like remind something of what someone of what you've done for them in the past, right? Yeah. Any other ideas? Sometimes people oblige one another out of. Oh, Ruth, go ahead. This might go. This might be a lot like using the data, but. You know, sometimes if you point out to the person how their gifts perfectly match the thing that you Yes, so, so Ruth is giving all her secrets away of how she persuades people to do things at church. But she said sometimes if you talk about what, how someone's gifts match the, the job that you're trying to entice them towards, then that, then that works. You can also, sometimes people try to persuade with morality. Right, like it's the right thing to do, um, uh, or or compliments, right? Like you say some really nice things about the person before you ask them to do something. Tell them they're the best suited for the job. <laughs> Tell them they're the best suited for the job. Yes, similar to, to what what Ruth has suggested. So there's lots of strategies, right? And and Paul uses almost all of them. Paul is really good at persuading people to do things. That's why he was such a great evangelist throughout the ancient world. And he uses almost all of these techniques in this letter that you just heard uh, that he writes to a man named uh, Philemon um, and the church gathered in Philemon's house. I'm saying his name, I cannot get into my head, but you say it a different way. David, it's Philemon. <laughs> I'll try to say Philemon. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so, uh, Paul gives thanks for Philemon and says wonderful things about his ministry. He considers, he says, ordering Philemon to do what he wants, but instead appeals to him on the basis of love. He uses logical arguments. He uses moral arguments. He reminds him of how much he owes him, and he also offers to repay him. And then he wraps up by saying this confident of your obedience <laughs> i am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than i say <laughs> so he's leaving no room for argument he's really hard to say no to paul so in all of that persuasion which surely so beautifully read for us you may have missed what it is that paul is asking philemon to do does anyone you may know from other from other sources did anyone catch like what this is all about David knows. <laughs> Tell us, David. He wants the uh, Onesimus to accept his former slave who ran away back as a brother. He wants Philemon to do that. Yeah, Onesimus is the name of the enslaved yeah. person. Yes. He wants, he wants Philemon to do that. And that was radical. Was yes. Radical in the first yes. He did not ever do that. Under all this flattery is radical, <laughs> radical request. So, Paul is in prison, as he often was, uh, because of his ministry. He got put in prison all the time. And during this particular imprisonment, he has been helped out by a, na a man named Onesimus, who is an enslaved person, whose enslaver is Philemon. Now, during their time together, Paul has become very close to Onesimus. And Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon with this letter, asking, telling Philemon to set Onesimus free from his enslavement. Radical stuff. There are so many questions that we could ask about this story. For instance, did Onesimus run away from Philemon 
or did Philemon send Onesimus to serve Paul? We don't know. People argue it both ways. Does Paul consider Onesimus valuable now because of Onesimus's religious conversion to Christianity? Or because of his usefulness to Paul during Paul's imprisonment? Or has Paul come to understand the inherent value of all people? The problems of slavery, which was so prevalent in that time and place. When dealing with this story, we also have to consider that this is one of several biblical texts that have been used to enforce the practice of slavery in this country and beyond. Because Paul is following Roman law by sending an enslaved person back to their enslaver, even if he does so with a letter begging the enslaver to free that person. So this text has been used to cause harm. It is a harmful text. And for all the questions and the problems in this text, I still think it has the potential to help us or I wouldn't have had it read this morning. Although it's always good to own up to our scriptural sins as well. But I think there is something of value also in this text. So Paul's very persuasive voice can come to us in this place and in this time to prod our consciences. His letter can invite us to consider in which ways we may be at least a little bit like Philemon. What privileges or rights or possessions do we claim which we might need to re-examine? What have we become comfortable with that is maybe pervasive in our society, which is truly unjust and needs to be changed? The question is really what I want you to take with you. We could go in many directions, right? You could like uh, on this day and Labor Day weekend of labor issues, right? The need for a living wage, better protections against discrimination in the workforce. We could think of other policies and patterns of discrimination and dehumanization in our society. We could also think about personal day-to-day -day interactions, right? Who at school, is being left out or made fun of because someone has decided that they are less important than other folks or who at church or in our social networks or in our town or in our culture is judged as less than and given less than they deserve the name onesimus means useful but how terrible for a person or a group of people to be measured by whether they are useful to someone else. Our faith teaches us rather that all people are precious children of God. We are beautiful in our diversity and equal in our value. We are worthy of respect and justice and love, all of us. So how can we each be converted as Paul was and as we hope that Philemon was as well when he received this letter to recognize that every other person has fundamental worth. What are the next steps towards a more inclusive way of life for us as individuals and as a church? Please pray with me. Holy God, from our birth, we have been taught in words spoken and in ways unspoken that some folks are more valuable than others and that it's okay to be unfair to people who aren't very important. Help us learn from you instead that we ourselves and everyone we meet are made in your own image, part of the same heart and the same family. Teach us again and again, persuade us with every method you can find until we are freed from evil ideas for the liberty of your love. Amen.